Oh, oh, welcome. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm recording and it is the first day of August. Oh my goodness, the summer goes by so quickly. <laughs> today, I want to actually read you an article that I wrote some number of years ago, but I find that I refer to it very often. Um, it actually has some of the inventory rules that are special for artists. So it has this little, little tax thing in it that I want you to know, but it's about advocacy. It's about political organizing. And it's an article where I'm kind of questioning the status quo. And it's an article I feel really proud of and has remained relevant. <laughs> so I thought I would read it today, um, do something a little different on the podcast and read this article I wrote in 2018 for you so that you have it here on the podcast. Um, I'm feeling inspired in this way um, to read a civic oriented article that I wrote because I was just a part of an event for my local Democratic Party organization um, this past weekend. I was a speaker and I helped organize an event basically to help us meet the neighbors, to invite new people in the neighborhood because a lot of people have been moving to my small city. And the point was to invite a whole bunch of new people to see what the Democratic Party is doing, what we're up to. Um, and I think that this is important. And I say this, you know, I am a Democrat. Like, I want to be kind of honest and upfront that I, I do have a political orientation. But, you know, it's based on thoughtful reasoning. And I, you know, I'm pretty quick to point out when Republicans do right. I think that's important. I think that... Uh, our world is getting so polarized. And I think the most dangerous thing in American politics right now is our inability to see the good in each other. So I'm not here for hate. <laughs> I'm not here for hate on anyone. I think civility is for all people. And it will start with me. So I just wanted to bring you this article today because I was giving a talk and trying to encourage people to get involved, whatever side you're on, non-side, unaffiliated. You know, I hope that you do help organize people where you live, because voting happens in your neighborhood. There are issues in your neighborhood that are important. It might be uh, policies about how the streets get used, pedestrian deaths, walkability in your neighborhood. There's all kinds of issues. The national stage is the one we all focus on, and it tends to be the one where, where we have the least amount of power. But local politics, you have so much power so, so much power. And a lot of people don't have enough information about local politics because of the death of small, small scale newspaper, uh, newspapers. And so like, it's hard to stay on top of local issues. I definitely encourage you to do what you can. Um, a podcast that I absolutely love here in Asheville is called the Overlook podcast. It is hosted by my colleague and friend, Matt Pikin, who was a former NPR news reporter for the local station, BPR News here. And uh, I've I've supported, I've bought ads, I've supported him because I feel really passionately that local news is so, so, so important and staying informed on local issues is really awesome. And one of the cool things about local politics is that it's less partisan. It tends to be less polarized, right? Like how cars drive on your street. And if it's dangerous, you know, there's no party needed for that, right? You don't want your kids to get hit no matter who you are. <laughs> so um, I just want to give a shout out for political involvement at all levels, certainly, but the ones where you have the most power and the strongest leverage for affecting change, I think we should get involved in. I think people forget <laughs> that your city council, you, you might not even know who's running for your city council, right? Or what the local issues are. And I encourage you to get involved because, oh my God, your effort in those areas can go so far. So with that all said, with my me with my civics hat on today, I want to read you this, what I think is a really great article. I want you to know that I passed, I wrote this article shortly after Trump came into office and the um, Congress uh, uh, became Republican, went from being Democrat to Republican. Um, and it was right at the time that the Republicans passed a new tax law. They raced this through, basically it was the first item on the agenda when Trump came into office. Um, it's honestly why I think a lot of Republicans who really did not agree with a lot of what Trump stood for, uh, I think it's why they still elected him. They wanted this tax bill. And um, 
I want to be here for you for the civic angle to help you understand the the civics behind the tax laws that get passed, the sort of trends that happen in taxation, because (laughs) I know that if you're listening to this podcast, if you're a creative person, you are very likely a bit of a rabble rouser as a more above average civically engaged person. And that, you know, if you have a little bit more uh, facts and knowledge about how our tax code works, you will have more power in advocating for fairer laws. So with that said, um, also, I'm going to link to this article in my show notes today so you can um, you can read it in written format. I also want to credit Hyperallergic. I originally wrote this um, as a columnist for the art blog Hyperallergic. Um, so it originally was published there on March 15th, 2019. Okay, without further ado, here is my article called Tax Policy Should Be Part of Our Basic Civic Education. Taxes are our only mandatory civic duty. So why is tax education left out of civics by Hannah Cole? All right, here goes. You probably recall a school lesson in your past about our bicameral legislature or the separation of powers between our three branches of government. But did you ever get a lesson in graduated income tax rates, the personal exemption, or how freelancers pay into their social security? When the president tries to extract a pledge of loyalty from someone in the Justice Department, an alarm goes off about those separation of powers. And as a citizen, you understand a basic tenet of our democracy is being tested. But what about when states propose funding budget shortfalls by increasing the sales tax, which is one of our most regressive taxes, or politicians quietly double the threshold on the estate tax? one of our most powerful tools for fighting fighting the widening wealth gap. Do these actions trigger the same sense of alarm? Our founding fathers recognized that the maintenance of our democracy would require a population educated in basic civic responsibility. The establishment of a public school system was part of this understanding. Without public education, Civic education would be reserved for the wealthy, and the uneducated masses would be subject to the whims of tyrants. Public schools and civic education have been a deliberate cornerstone of our democracy since the American Revolution. We should all be educated in the basic structure and functions of our government so that we can advocate for ourselves and keep our democracy healthy. While civic participation is not as robust as it could be, it exists. People do vote. They do advocate for different policies and appeal to their legislatures, legislators or run for public office themselves. So why in our democracy is the one part of civic engagement that is mandatory, that is paying taxes, not also a part of our basic civic education? From my vantage point as a tax accountant for artists and creative people, I can see how acute this lack of the information is. In my tax practice, I regularly explain the basic mechanics of tax-sheltered retirement plans and clear up the near-constant confusion between itemized deductions and the business deductions one takes on one Schedule C. I give workshops to packed room after packed room of professional artists and designers who have never had a lesson on how self-employment tax works, how to pay estimated quarterly taxes, or how their self-employment tax pays into Social Security and Medicare. I say this with deep respect. Artists and creative professionals are generally better educated and more civically engaged than the average citizen. So if this population is underinformed on basic tax issues, I think the problem is much bigger. I think we have a civic education crisis. Again, the point of civic education is to cultivate an engaged participatory population, one that engages in honest, intellectually rigorous debate and makes good faith arguments about fairness and the society we want. And what place is more important than the mandatory civic engagement of tax paying? What shapes our society more than the money we all pay into it? What is more worthy of scrutiny than who pays a disproportionate share of their income compared to everyone else and why? What is a more important civic question than how our tax dollars are apportioned? What is a more fundamental civic question than what kind of society do we want to build with our tax dollars? 
I see a direct link between the general lack of understanding of our tax code and the thorough lack of advocacy on the part of the people most affected by it. Without this education in how our tax system is structured and who pays what proportion of their income, we can't engage in shaping a fairer tax policy. When politicians lie about who pays taxes, these lies don't get called out properly because they aren't obvious to everyone. When regressive tax policies are floated, such as increases to sales tax, which are disproportionately paid by the poor, people often don't realize that these taxes are regressive, so fairer alternatives don't get surfaced. The estate tax, the death tax label, P.S., is dishonest, and that's why I refuse to use it. The estate tax, which is a clear solution to a widening wealth gap based on centuries of evidence and decades of policy work, gets chipped away at constantly without enough defenders rising up to support it. As the massive new tax law changes were being passed, I kept wondering why people were not more up in arms over the dramatic reduction in charitable contributions that would likely result from doubling the standard deduction, the punishing of electorates in high-tax states with the capping of the state and local income tax deduction, and the boon provided to the wealthiest families in the U.S. by doubling the estate tax exemption. In 2017, before the tax law change, only 5,500 estates in the U.S. paid any estate tax. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 is expected to reduce that number to 1,900. All of these policies are the opposite of what most Americans want. Polling from the months before the passage of the bill made clear that Americans want higher, not lower, taxes on the wealthy and on corporations. But where was the debate? The bill was passed with breakneck speed. That is one reason for the lack of debate. But was our society's general lack of tax education another reason? But there's hope. I want to tell a story of a tax victory won by artists. The last time a tax bill this big was passed was the Tax Reform Act of 1986. In that law, Congress forced artists, writers, and performers to portion out the costs of producing their work and take the expenses on their taxes only when that work was sold. The law was so broad that even small amounts of material were to be accounted for in this way. So a painter was supposed to calculate the amount of paint she used on one canvas and then only take that expense on her taxes when that painting sold. This left artists with an accounting nightmare, as well as a dramatic reduction in their ability to claim expenses. Julia Child, the author and chef, protested the ridiculousness of the provision by saying, quote, how do I allocate the oregano? But the part I love is that we won. Artists understood the impact of this law, and they organized and protested. And what's more, when the resulting law change did not go far enough, they stuck with it, protested more, and got it changed again. The result is that independent artists, writers, and performers no longer have to keep inventory. We are allowed, by the sweat of our protesting peers, to expense all of our supplies in the year we buy them. So disengaging and accepting our fate is not a given. Correcting unfair tax laws is possible. But first, we do need to understand the laws. I personally do a lot of education on taxes, but the problem is nationwide. And I'm just using the tools I have. I don't think it's the role of business to fill this gap. This is a failure on a societal level that needs a policy solution. When we have the education, we make better decisions and we stop unjust laws from being passed. But when we check out or succumb to the idea that taxes are too complicated, we leave the laws to be crafted by lobbyists for well-funded groups that typically have a lot to gain. Everyone pays taxes. That is the one civic engagement with the most participation, and taxes are at the root of all other policies. Our advocacy won't be possible until we understand how we pay, who pays what, and who is getting the worst impact. We need tax education so we can better engage 
as citizens. That's my article, y'all. I hope you enjoyed it very much. I will put a link in the show notes so that you can read that yourself. You can share it with a friend. And um, if that inspired you in any way, I'd love it if you share the episode with a friend. Thank you so much for listening, y'all. I will see you next week. Bye. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, be sure to like, leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. I'm so grateful for that. This video is for education and entertainment only. Nothing in this episode should be taken as individual tax or financial advice. You can find all the tools, books, and links I reference at sunlighttax.com slash podcast.